by show of hands, who here is a new blogger? And they're hoping to just turn their side passion into a career. And by show of hands, who is here because they're not happy in their career? And they want to learn. <laughs> they want to <laughs> learn how to push this to the forefront. Great. And by show of hands, who is here because they actually love their job, but they want to know how they can travel more often and keep their career? That's fine, too. Well, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Ditching the 9 to 5 workshop. My name is Nikki Vargas, and I am a travel journalist. I have published work in Matador Network, in Food & Wine Magazine, Roads and Kingdoms, and Vice, to name a few. I'm also the founder and editor of the Pin Mat Project, which was voted a top site of 2015, where I oversee a team of writers, and I'm happy to say we're launching a magazine next month. So to start off with my own story, I moved to New York to be a journalist. The one thing I did not account for were bloggers. So when I studied journalism in school, bloggers were on the rise. And here's the thing. In our mind, while we were paying $40,000 for a journalism degree, people were just starting to write. And it was great. They were great at it. But in our mind, we thought that the line between journalism and bloggers was almost like the line between a home cook and a chef, that there was no way that we were on the same playing field. And then when I came to New York, I realized just how wrong I was about that. Everybody was trying to be a writer, and the market was cutthroat. So I ended up taking a bartending job, Midtown, Ainsworth, if anyone has been there, 27th Street. <laughs> <laughs> and I started just saving money, trying to get my own place, trying to get on my feet, applying for editorial jobs. And then one day, a girl and her friend walked in. They were celebrating a promotion, and I remember serving them champagne. When she went to pay her tab, she put a credit card on the table, and it had a Chicago backdrop on it. I was from Chicago, so I said hello. A week later, that conversation landed me a job at an advertising firm in downtown. I was a newly minted assistant media planner. It wasn't the plan, but it was better than serving cocktails to rambunctious guys at happy hour. So I took the job. But the thing is, is that that one job ended up being the next four years of my life. And I got off track. My career started to look like a giant speed date. I would do one year in advertising here, and I'd think, God, I'm ready for the next thing. So then I'd switch over to marketing. I would do marketing, and then I thought, oh, this isn't right. So I would go over to PR. And the whole time, I was applying for editorial, but the problem was I had gone too far off track. I'd gone too far down this one route. I hadn't done anything except a couple assignments on the side since journalism school. I hadn't started the right way, and I didn't know how to go back. I wanted the dream job. How did she get the dream job? I started to look for it, and that was my speed date. It wasn't in PR, it wasn't in marketing, and it wasn't in advertising. And I kept bouncing around. And finally, I thought to myself, if I can't create, or if I can't find my dream job, I would create it. And so I started the Pin the Map project. So I put the map up on my wall, and it's still there today. And I started to pin all the places I wanted to see. And when I stepped back from that map and seen the places that I had actually been to, I became acutely aware of how much of the world I had not visited yet. Whole continents I had not set foot on. And here's the thing. I was north of 25. I wasn't getting any richer. Definitely not getting any younger. And life was moving quickly. And I had a feeling in that one moment, looking at that map, that Ten years from that point, I could be looking at that map again and see that no pins were added, that nothing had changed, that I had moved down this one path, and the only sacrifice was everything I wanted to do. So I decided right then and there I would start the Pin the Map project. It was a personal endeavor to prove to myself that I could reprioritize my life to add more pins to my map, and at the same time, that I could essentially show myself and show anyone that you didn't have to be rich. You don't have to be on a trust fund to travel now. I'm in my 20s. I'm working at a mid-level job in Manhattan. I'm living in an apartment that is too expensive that I can barely afford. I wanted to show that I could travel now. I started to go on press trips. I started to review hotels. I went to France. I went to Morocco. I started writing for publications. I started working with brands. And this side passion of mine started to catch fire. And it was 
amazing. But the thing is, is it started to grow pressure on my life. And all of a sudden, it became the tale of two Nikki's. On one hand, Nikki the Traveler. The Pin the Map project was my field of dreams. In that world, I wasn't someone's bride to be. I wasn't someone's employee. I was Nikki the Travel Writer. I could be anyone I wanted to be, and I felt powerful in that world. But that world was this small, because in the real world, I was a different person. Nikki the bride to be. Nikki the advertiser. Nikki struggling with money on the Upper East Side. It was really hard to reconcile those two parts of myself, and pressure started to mount. At work, I would go to work, and I remember that there would be the job I was paid to do, and then the job I wanted to do. And on the days that I chose to focus on the Pin the Mat project, I would get in trouble at work. I used to say that when I'm in trouble, people call me Nicole. I was called Nicole a lot in those days. But on the days that I focused on work, the Pin the Mat project went unloved. It wasn't updated, and it felt like something was pulling at me, because that's what I wanted to be doing. In my personal life, the Pin the Mat project started to take its toll. My fiance and I at the time, we had met before we graduated college. And we were a good match back then. But then, as I started to wade into this world of travel writing, of what I wanted to do with my life, it became clear that our futures were going in different directions. He wanted suburbia. He wanted a family. He wanted the American dream, the white picket fence, and there is nothing wrong with that. I wanted to go volunteer with elephants in Thailand. I wanted to take a year off to backpack in Southeast Asia. And it was very hard to reconcile those differences. Everything was starting to get to a boiling point. From the outside looking in, everything was perfect. She's planning her wedding. Everything was roses, and my life was chiffon and silks and advertising and perfect. On the inside, everything was starting to crumble. It was at this time that I got an assignment from the Daily Meal to go down to Argentina to write about the cafe scene in Palermo. I, it was a month before my wedding. My mom thought I had a mental break. <laughs> <laughs> I did too. I remember being on the plane at JFK alone, my first time solo traveling, and I remember thinking, you've really done it this time. You've really lost your marbles this time. I didn't know anyone in Argentina. I didn't have a single friend in the world. I was going to be alone in the country, alone in the continent. And I went. I went to Buenos Aires, and I drank more red wine than I'd care to admit. <laughs> I ate more red meat than I'd care to admit. And then I met a traveler who told me that you have to go to Iguazu, the waterfalls on the border of Argentina. I see some people nodding. You guys know how amazing it is. <laughs> on the border of Argentina and Brazil. And I thought, great, let's do it. The next morning I woke up, I booked a flight, threw everything in a backpack, and I went to Iguazu by myself. At Iguazu National Park, I started <coughs> hiking in the jungle. And then I was alone, and I decided to ask myself the questions I had been actively avoiding in New York. I couldn't breathe in New York. I couldn't, I couldn't see <coughs> myself or my life for what it was. But there, I started talking to myself. And I mean literally, I was walking through the jungles talking to myself. If anyone had seen me, they'd really think I'd lost my marbles then. Mm -hmm. And I started to ask myself the questions that I hadn't asked. Are you happy? No. I wasn't happy. I wasn't happy in my career, because I never wanted that career. I wasn't happy in my personal life. We were fighting. Everything felt like it was being done for someone else. Do you want to get married? No. <laughs> now, this is a month. <laughs> A month before my wedding, yikes. I didn't want to get married. He, and not because of him, because he was and is an amazing man. I didn't want to get married because it felt like the end of dreaming. So I went back to New York with those newfound truths, with the strength I had gathered from solo traveling, and I called off my wedding two weeks before it was supposed to take place. There are eight things I did when I started the Pin the Map project. The first thing I did, I gave myself a trial period. Now, 
Here's the thing. I used to have a fashion blog. I used to have a restaurant blog. I used to have a foodie blog, a Chicago Review blog, and then a postgraduate woe is me blog. And all of those <laughs> blogs ceased to exist. So I told myself, once I decided to have the travel blog, I told myself, listen, three months. If I dedicate myself three months to this blog, and I update it every week at least two to three times, and I enjoy doing that, then I'll take it to the next level. Step two, I invested in my website. Your website, your homepage, is like your face. It's your first impression. The next thing I knew to do was to lean on publications and bloggers to grow my traffic. Now here's the thing. You start out as a blog. You can't swing a bag without knocking over 10 bloggers today. Everybody has a blog. How do you get people to visit your blog? Well, there's two things. You could do it on your own, and that is a very slow uphill battle. Yeah. Or you can append yourself to more successful bloggers, to bigger brands. So what I did was I started freelance writing for other publications, at first for free, Thought Catalog, Elite Daily. These are two of the publications that have massive traffic. They don't pay you anything, but they give you giant exposure. And anytime you write an article for them and people look at your author bio, author bio and they see your website, you have a new reader. Thought Catalog, Elite Daily are two examples. Now they, they don't, nope, nope, they're not strictly for travel and so, and that's a great question. So if you, if travel isn't necessarily the focus of your site, those are two sites that are lifestyle. Other bloggers, look at other bloggers in the space you admire. See if you can guest write for their site. Every time you do that, they share it on their social media channels. You get new readers, you get new following, you get new associations. And that's how I started to grow traffic on the Pin the Map project. The fourth thing, and this I cannot stress enough, was because I worked in advertising, I knew that when brands work with bloggers, they rarely approach a blogger themselves. They instead go to a company that represents bloggers. Mode Media, Say Media, are two of the biggest blogger network companies out there. They're a liaison between bloggers and the advertisers who want to work with them. First one, use your vacation days wisely. I had 10 vacation days out of 365 days of the year, of which I could call my own. Add company holidays to that, and now it was about 20. Not a lot, but you could work with it. First thing, append those days to existing holidays. Simple enough. President's Day weekend, Martin Luther King weekend, Memorial Day weekend. You add two, three days, and all of a sudden you have a decent sized trip. And then you travel when no one else does. And now this is very important, not only for balancing work and travel, but also for saving a lot on travel. The key, and there are a lot of travel hackers out there, there are endless tips on travel hacking, but it all comes down to this one truth. If you want to save on travel, if you want to shave dollars off airfare, you travel when no one else does. The key is inconvenience. Explore your HR programs. A lot of them, for example, I worked at an agency called MediaVest, and we had Liquid Talent, and that was the name of our uh, company travel program. This is a big initiative of companies today, so ask your HR and see if your company offers any programs like that. Opportunities to work remotely. Same thing. You're going to Paris. You have a week in Paris to yourself, and you're not ready to go back to New York, and I don't blame you. But how do you stay longer? You don't want to use up vacation days. Your office might have an office, or your company might have an office in Paris. See about working remotely. Look for weekend getaways where you live. Look for ways to still travel, to fuel that fire while you're still working. And last but not least, go freelance. So these tips are also my own mistakes and things I learned. Number one, multiple revenue streams. The way I live today is I have three buckets of which my money comes from. The Pin the Mat project, one big bucket. Advertising, brand partnerships, sponsored content, custom programs, that is its own bucket. Freelance writing, anytime I take on an assignment. 
I get money from those assignments. And last but not least, freelance advertising. I just finished doing four days at an ad agency, helping them out with the AOL account. Before that, I had done one week between trips at a creative agency, helping them with a new business pitch. So those are my three revenue streams. And it's important when you're going freelance to keep in mind that more often than not, you'll have to create multiple revenue streams. You'll have to go from a singular stream of having a bi-weekly paycheck and the comfort of that check coming from your nine to five job to all of a sudden getting creative. Now it's a hard transition, but it's an exciting one because you're ultimately in control. Adapting to a new payment schedule. Now, this one was probably why I messed up the most. I guess I thought that, and I, and I tend to be very romantic and run away with ideas. So I guess I thought that if I, when I quit my nine to five job, my life would look something between like, you know, drinking coconuts on the beach and then having money just fall from trees. <laughs> and that was not the case. Money was sporadic, to say the least. There were some months where I was like a Rockefeller. Money was coming in, I had freelance assignments, I had advertising assignments, I had brand partnerships. And then the very next month, I was like Oliver Twist, sitting there like counting pennies. And the issue is that I hadn't adapted to a new payment schedule. And that goes very closely with revenue streams. The Pin the Mat project, I get paid almost instantaneously. Freelance writing. Sometimes I get paid immediately, sometimes I get paid three months later. Freelance advertising, usually I get paid on a weekly basis. But the point is, is that my payments came in at different times. And I had to learn to adapt to that. I no longer had the comfort of a bi-weekly paycheck being direct deposited into my account. I had to learn how to manage my money, how to set money aside, number three, for the months where money was not coming in. Even if I had a big paycheck on the horizon, even if I had just finished a big project for a company and there was a big payout, and that was coming four months later. I had to learn how to manage my money. Also, learning to be my own mom. You have to keep yourself on track and give yourself structure so that you don't end up falling off the map. Speaking of falling off the map, staying social. When I was in advertising, I had a built-in social life. I had dinners, I had happy hours, I had water cooler talk. I met people and I was just always being social. And then all of a sudden, I went freelance and I felt like a pariah. Where was everybody? All of a sudden, my social life seemed to just end. It was because I was so used to having everything built in for me. I was used to having happy hours set for me, used to having people just come into the office for meetings. But that's not the case when going freelance. I had to make that effort. The fact that you guys are all here, that's making an effort. That's being social. You're here, you're networking, you're meeting people in the industry that you're interested in. Accepting guilt-free office gigs. Now, when I went freelance, I felt very guilty when I had to go back to work, even if it was for a week here or four days there, because I felt like a fraud. And I'm not gonna kid you guys. Leading a nine to five, leading a ditching the nine to five workshop and then having to be in the office like two weeks ago for four days, I felt like the biggest fraud on earth. That is the wrong mentality. Here's the thing, when you go freelance, when you ditch the nine to five, you're choosing to take that side passion and put it into the forefront of your life. Whatever you need to do to achieve that dream, there is no shame in that. If you have to take on a bartending job, if you have to go back to the office for two weeks here or there, if you're blogging, if you're taking photography assignments, whatever it is you're doing, the point is not that you ditched the nine to five, the point is that you reprioritized your life, that you took that side passion and you put it above the work of a company that you have no interest in being in. And finally, creating opportunities for yourself. If you're going to ditch the nine to five, have a plan. If you're a writer, try to have some assignments on the horizon. If you're a blogger, have some networking events on the horizon. Reach out to some companies in advance. See if you can lock down some partnerships before you jump ship. Whatever it is, try to create opportunities for yourself so that the day you wake up on a Monday morning and you do not have to roll out of bed and go to the office, you're not totally shell-shocked because you have nothing on the horizon. So what to take away from all this? Because there's a lot of information. 
If I could give you one takeaway on ditching the nine to five job, it's this. The only thing standing in the way between you and ditching the nine to five world is yourself. Life does not slow down. There's never gonna be a perfect time to do this. You're never gonna have enough money to make this choice. Responsibilities are never gonna magically dissipate. Here's the thing, obstacles are tossed in your way. Old age sneaks up on you like a thief in the night. And before you know it, you turn around and your life's gone. You are the only person that can make this change. And that's it. So, <laughs> questions. <laughs> and my email. If anybody has questions, feel free to ask. And if anybody has you know, more technical, personal questions, feel free to email. <laughs>